Thank you everyone uh, so much for joining us today and I'm hoping that um, as I tell you our story it might help you and we can also um, join up later on and help one another because I'm still on this journey as well. So we've been looking at as a school we are a gold rights respecting school and we fully embed the UN Convention of the Rights for the Child. So evaluating our progress during our last gold reaccreditation visit we identified the need for a greater awareness of diversity. A, si a significant moment for us which highlighted the need for change was the death of George Floyd. Parents contacted the school wanting to know how to support their children's understanding of the situation and their awareness of racism. We created lessons and online learning but realised that this should not be restricted to an annual event during Black History Month. Race equality and anti-racist education needs to be built into the curriculum, culture and structures of the school for positive and sustained changes. In May 2021, our staff completed a self-evaluation exercise based on the challenge questions that you find in Higgias 4. Diversity and equity were identified as areas of development but staff reported they felt uncomfortable discussing and teaching topics relating to diversity. Their concerns included a lack of lived experience and knowledge. They were worried about using the wrong language and terminology. They were concerned about perceived parental views. And there was a personal fear of uncon unconscious bias. And there was that lack of age appropriate materials for the primary sector. Interestingly, 50% stated that they teach awareness and celebration of diversity, but 50% felt that we didn't, it wasn't embedded in our curriculum. When we delved deeper, we saw that of the 50% that they said had taught awareness and diversity, many of those lessons were limited to celebrating religious festivals. This highlighted the differences in what colleagues considered to be sufficiently educating in terms of diversity and led us to challenge these ideas. Acknowledging staff views that they understood the importance of diversity and anti-racism, but lacked confidence, professional knowledge, and for the majority lived experience, was an important starting point for us. Using Howard's Achievement Triangle as an evaluation tool encouraged transformationist pedagogy and changes to learning and teaching. The three sides of the triangle of knowing myself, knowing my pupils and knowing my practice interconnect. Howard refers to the point of connection of knowing my practice and knowing my pupils as rigour because we're committed to our practice and know who we are as educators. At the point of connection of knowing myself and knowing my pupils, there is of course relationships. This is the position of knowing who we are and having the knowledge of who the learners are. Through knowing individual pupils, particularly those marginalised, they see that we care about them and the connection we make is authentic. The final point connects knowing pupils and knowing practice. This involves responding to the learners who are in our class and ensuring that our practice and environment connects with everyone. Outlining an approach of learning together without fear of failure or a blame culture encourage staff to be open and honest when reflecting on knowing myself through attending training of critical consciousness. Professional learning has been an essential element of progression and has taken on many forms. Initially, it focused on the importance and necessity of promoting a culture of diversity, highlighting systemic issues of inequity and discrimination within society. Researching the roots of racism and recognising that the concept of race has no biological basis, but it's a system of social categorisation, was an essential step. Only through understanding racism and the different forms it takes can we challenge it and make a difference. We've been supported by an external consultant, Sadia Hussein Zavuk, who led the session on critical consciousness and has been an excellent support and guide throughout all this process. Creating a professional learning library of books and publications encouraged colleagues to widen their knowledge and recommend texts to one another. 
having diversity and equity as an agenda item for departmental meetings involved everyone. Sharing and discussing articles developed a culture of collaborative learning, and in these meetings, uncomfortable issues have been explored, including personal beliefs around discrimination, white privilege and assumptions. Within a safe environment, staff, staff support one another to move forward, question views and share research. An aim has been to increase awareness and conversation around diversity. A newly founded staff book group selected the text, This Book is Anti-Racist by Jewel, and they focused on that. Over coffee and cake, colleagues shared their own experiences and reflected on their spheres of influence. A challenge of leading this focus is ensuring that all staff are involved and have time to reflect on their beliefs and practice and feel empowered to challenge assumptions. Allocating considerable time for professional learning on diversity during in-service days, staff meetings and departmental meetings has ensured that all staff are engaged with and are supported, supported with this crucial focus. Two colleagues are currently participating in the Building Racial Literacy Programme, and that's a really helpful source for evaluating our practice. A staff focus group has been instrumental in co-constructing a plan to lead change. This group critically engaged with publications and texts. Some are displayed on the slide shown. Guidance from Education Scotland and the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, and in particular their staff evaluation tool, provided a vital structure to inform and support our professional learning and identify measures of progress. Our focus group that worked hard, they developed a mission statement outlining the school's five A's of diversity. So at Heriot's, we aim to foster the five A's of diversity. Our pupils, staff and parents are aware of differences in society. They acknowledge their own biases and difficulties that may occur due to these biases. They accept and appreciate the UNCRC Article 2, non-discrimination, and aim to be an ally to show respect and mitigate against inequality. Feedback on our five A's was sought from pupil groups, parents and staff. Engagement with pupils, staff and parents is essential. Otherwise, there's a real danger of making assumptions about the best way forward, which could be ineffective and at worst reinforce racial discrimination or alienate those who are served to benefit most from this. Our students demonstrate their passion for diversity and equity through their involvement in pupil diversity groups, and these groups are encouraged to lead change. One of the most impactful training sessions for staff was led by our senior school pupil diversity ambassadors. They shared their experiences of various forms of racism in education, including incorrect pronunciation of a name or avoidance of calling on someone by their name, making cultural assumptions about people's backgrounds and discriminatory language behaviour. They also experienced, they also shared experiences of not being seen in some educational contexts such as no pictures of girls from BAME background studying science subjects. This was a powerful message for staff to acknowledge how unintentional actions can be discriminatory and that everyone has a part to play in changing behaviour, attitudes and processes. From the work of this group, five key themes for action were identified and are shown on the table displayed. To address the first point, staff compiled a register of all names written phonetically. This has been useful, especially further up the school where some pupils have many teachers. For the second point, members of the staff focus group were honest about their experiences of making cultural assumptions. This group were open with colleagues, helping everyone to reflect on their practice and recognise that it's vital to know all your pupils. Taking time to consider, and identify cultural assumptions within the curriculum was also a key focus. For the third point, the pupils were keen that all staff instigate discussions which show awareness of discrimination. This may come up via a history topic or a novel study. Every class in the primary school has a copy of the book All About Diversity, and class teachers use it as a stimulus for many discussions. Assembly messages support this, as do lessons on diversity. 
Professional learning supported the fourth point, as did the support materials created by the City of Edinburgh Council for schools to develop an inclusive, diverse and decolonised curriculum. As Professor Rowena Arshad says, having the knowledge, awareness, skills and dispositions to talk about race and racism is a professional competence. For the final point, covering being open and honest rather than saying nothing, pupils ask staff not to be afraid of participating in uncomfortable conversations. They said that something is always better than nothing and that any attempt at challenging discrimination will be less harmful than ignoring it altogether. Pupils in a primary school are keen to raise awareness of diversity. They've written and led several assemblies, including celebrating different religious festivals, focusing on Black History Month and highlighting diversity and discrimination with the common theme of be an upstander, not a bystander. They were instrumental in updating the school library to include a more diverse range of texts and authors and are now in the process of reviewing their classroom libraries. The Pupil Diversity Ambassadors completed an audit of displays around the school, calling themselves Diversity Display Detectives, the group photographed displays which promote diversity. They showcased these examples in a video explaining to staff the importance of everyone being able to see themselves in displays and linking it in with the UNCRC. Engagement with parents involving inviting parents to a con consultation evening where we shared our vision, reasons for change to the curriculum and approach to promoting a culture of diversity and equity. Organising small group discussions led to useful conversations and feedback helping us to widen our perspective. Looking, thinking back to that achievement triangle and knowing my practice, our target is for all teachers to analyse the curriculum with criticality. A helpful tool for decolonising the curriculum is the anti-racist critical thinking model. It can be applied to lessons, topics, resources, novel studies and even school events. We started small with every teacher using this model to review one area of the curriculum each term. Most chose to focus on their social studies or topic work. Primary one made changes to their Wonderland topic, bringing in fairy tales or more diverse, diverse culturally, and also challenged gender stereotypes. Our primary fives found more diverse historical figures to study and widened their topic to include slavery. Our P7 World War II topic was widened to include the soldiers from the British Indian Army who were part of the world's largest volunteer army. When decolonising the curriculum, we looked at building a wider range of perspectives into the work that we already do. This made it more manageable for colleagues. Staff were asked to consider stereotypes, assumptions and whose voice is not heard. This was aligned with key themes of social justice and global citizenship. I'm really fortunate to work with a fantastic team and they took the lead in many areas. A dedicated group of teachers created a series of lessons on equity and diversity for nursery aged children through to those in P7. The Senior School Pupil Diversity Group reviewed our materials and our lessons. The evaluation of primary pupils was very positive with the children showing a real interest and commitment to pro promoting a culture of diversity and equity. The lessons begin in the nursery where we discuss differences and the value of them to primary one and two where we discuss what racism is and where our skin colour comes from. To primary six where we explore concepts such as privilege and discrimination and their impact. A range of books support this learning and reflection. We face challenge about decolonising the curriculum with some suggesting that this approach could even be illegal. Referring to research and consultation with Sadia supported our stance alongside encouraging viewing the changes as not being threatening, but empowering for everyone based on core values. The ethos of being a rights respecting school permeates everything. As part of the Into Headship course, we were introduced to Murphy's COPE process for dealing with dilemmas. And I found that helpful and would recommend employing this approach when facing any challenging situation. Well, work continues on our curriculum and also on reviewing school policies and structures, including recruitment. Our new staff inductions include a focus on diversity and equity. 
Some challenges and tensions leading work promoting diversity I experienced include people being hesitant to be involved through a lack of knowledge or lived experience, some thinking that there's not a problem and therefore no need for this work or their involvement, a danger of approaching it at surface level and not making a sustainable change, and finding time for staff to explore approaches and engage in meaningful professional learning. I think it's helpful to remember that this is a long process. We've been working on this for a couple of years and we still have more to do. This culture of change cannot be done to people, but it should be with people. Encouraging pupils to take the lead has been extremely impactful. The pupil diversity group set their own agendas for meetings and are passionate about promoting a culture of diversity and equity. They're also very honest and they'll quickly tell us if they see something that can be improved. Having a group of brilliant colleagues and critical friends such as Sadia, my tutor from the Interheadship group and the peers from that group as well from the cohort has been a huge support, especially when facing moments of challenge. As leaders in education, we need to work collaboratively and support one another to make a positive, di positive difference for our children so that they can live without fear of discrimination. I came into this process with a limited knowledge of anti-racist education, and I am far from being an expert. I'm still on the journey of learning, but I've got passion and determination to make sustained, sustained change for pupils in my care. Thank you. I'll stop sharing now, Kevin. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Kirsten. And I know we're going to get a really good opportunity later on to ask you questions about your practice and to reflect on your practice as well. But just want to say a massive thank you to you at this stage because that was a absolutely fantastic sharing of your own experience and your own learning uh, through this process as well. So thank you so much, Kirsten, for that. Before we move on to Kate, just a wee reminder, if you have got questions that you want to ask, please feel free to put them into the chat just now and we can pick them up um, at the end of both the presentations. So don't hold that thought in your head because if you're anything like me, you'll forget it by the time we get to the end of the presentation. So feel free to pop those in the chat as we go. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Kate Fraser. So Kate is currently Deputy Head Teacher at the Royal High School in Edinburgh who's recently received a very positive uh, inspection report from uh, HMI. So congratulations to you, Kate, and to your colleagues on that. I've got a little bit of a bio here about um, Kate. So we're going to learn some new and interesting facts about her. So you'll probably tell from her accent pretty quickly that she was born in the city of Liverpool and is a Scouser. And uh, she had a brief stint working with the Education Department of the Edinburgh International Festival um, after she completed her history degree and she trained as a teacher in 1998. So Kate is a history teacher and became curricular leader of history and modern studies for 13 years. And then she became a deputy head teacher seven years ago. And like Kirsten, she was part of cohort seven for Into Headship last year. So professional learning has always been really important to Kate and the reflection that comes from that. And she completed a master's in education from the Open University in 2009. So Kate, it's fantastic to have you here and to be able to hear from you and share thinking with you. So with that, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Kirsten. Um, it's a great honour and pleasure to be here just to share our um, journey that, that we've been on. And I was lucky to share the process with Kirsten last year as part of the Interheadship uh, programme as well. Um, just a note about language. Kevin made reference to this uh, earlier. Within our context and our local setting, we've been working very closely with intercultural youth who've been giving us some fantastic support on our journey and working with our community that the terminology that our community like to use is BPOC, uh, so Black and People of Colour, so that will be the language that uh, and the terminology that I'll be using um, through our, uh, through my presentation today. Um, so really starting from our journey towards um, a co-construction of anti-racist curriculum. I mean, it really starts from me, I suppose, uh, in terms of uh, my profound interest in social justice was really what initially drew me to this work um, in that, you know, I fundamentally believe that we uh, as, as educators have responsibility to try and improve uh, the lives for young people. 
And that's what motivated me to become a teacher. And it's what has motivated me um, in leading this work as well. Um, as a historian by trade, I have always been profoundly interested in the lens through which events are, are viewed through um, and uh, the perspectives that, that come across, because of course that is what you do in history all the time. And I think as I've, as my, I guess my positioning within school has changed, my perspective on that has grown more from just a history curriculum that we're delivering, but actually to the wider uh, curriculum across uh, the school um, as well. Um, and as I've taken that whole perspective about the curriculum, I've really, really started to, to question where that knowledge is coming from or why is that knowledge prioritised within the curriculum itself? Where has, has that come from? Um, and that's just something I've I've been personally interested in, but actually it's something I've wanted to explore with the, the school community. Um, and sort of the context of this within our school is that as a school, we've been working hard um, over a number of years to really address many different aspects of uh, inequality within our, our school curriculum um, and looking at racial inequality is one that I think the perspective that we had been taking it we were very reactive in that in that I think that we we tried our very best to react to racist incidents um, as and when they were happening um, but what we really wanted to explore and what I really want to lead on was how we could be more proactive in actually stopping those events from from happening in the first place and of course that is stemming from the curriculum and the values and, and what we are teaching our young people within our, our school itself um, and like Kirsten mentioned as well I was profoundly moved by the Black Lives Matter movement which really made me question my position within that and really encouraged me to do a lot of personal reading uh, within that process um, particularly um, challenging my own personal bias within that as well and my own notions of white privilege that I didn't ask for but I have been born with um, so exploring that so that was kind of my own personal perspective within that but really looking at the drivers within the school um, and, and where this positioned itself within uh, the school itself of course there were the the international legislation, and you know, there is kind of legislation and policy documents around this. Of course, we were shaped, um, as Kirsten was, uh, uh, with regards to the UNCRC, and of course that, you know, eventually becoming enshrined within within Scottish law. Um, the national priorities, of course, in terms of things like the Equalities Act, those fundamental principles of curriculum for excellence, which of course place a huge emphasis on that notion of the development of democratic citizenship and where that positions itself, you know, how the curriculum is, is supporting that uh, process. Um, you know, there were, um, there is priorities from the, the local authority within City of Edinburgh in that there is a framework that they are um, carrying out across all of their estate actually in, in the city in terms of really challenging discrimination and, and racism. There was some great work that was also being carried out at Liberton High School that we were very aware of. Um, but also we, we wanted very much to view this through our own lens. So actually the, the, the perspective of the Royal High School. Um, you can see on that, that slide there, we belong here, sits at the heart of the vision of our school in that we want every young person who, who joins our community to really feel that they belong here. And actually in the first year of this programme, we really began to see that some felt that they didn't belong within our community and it was something that we really needed to address and, and to think about uh, within that. Um, every year we do sadly still have racist incidents that are occurring um, between our young people um, so we very much wanted to, 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 to challenge that. Um, we have almost uh, 200 young people within our school who identify as um, black, as, as BPOC, um, and we wanted to make sure that they could see themselves represented within the curriculum, but more important, not more importantly, but sitting alongside that as well, we're also very aware that as a school, we are educating the next generation of police officers and people that are screening application forms and, and members of society. So we really wanted to make sure that we were supporting all of our community and our, our, our white community to 
move on that journey from white awareness more towards my white allyship as well and that movement from reactive to more proactive um work so so even though it is obviously viewed from um international and national policies we very much wanted it to be viewed through the lens of our own local community because in many ways for it to make sense it had to connect with our own um community so that's sort of the drivers um for change so our vision um, is to, um, you know, to focus on a curriculum, you know, which is um, multicultural with regards to the knowledge, knowledge that's valued and transmitted um, and through which cultural, religious and racial diversity is, is respected. Um, through this curriculum, we're wanting, you know, it's have the potential to educate all pupils to be tolerant and to challenge discrimination and to help support them to be members of a democratic society. So we have this um, sort of overarching visionary goal in terms of what we want to be uh, moving towards in, in this journey. Um, and when we're talking about curriculum here, we're not just talking about the explicit curriculum, um, that has been delivered within classrooms, but how that infiltrates down into the um, more hidden curriculum that's going on um, in schools as well. So in terms of the journey that we have been on, um, for all of last year, all we focused in on was the why, in that we, for this change to be fully embedded and for it not to be tokenistic and for everyone to really commit to why this should be a priority for our school. Um, we, with regards staff, spent the entire year focusing on professional learning and reflection time to support why we needed to do this. And I think as leaders, you know, we communicate such value in the time that we ring fence and prioritize for these sorts of discussions that, that take place. So right at the start of the year, we were looking at our working time agreement and we were ring fencing time for, um, for our staff to engage in this process. As part of this process, we created um, transparent um, leadership roles. So we opened up to staff to be able to apply for a leadership role um, from across the school community. So we were trying to make this process as um, horizontal as possible so, so to bring as many people as we could into this process itself. Um, so what we found was this process was quite challenging for some of our staff to go through uh, because of the reading that we we're presenting with them and it was really important that we were we were aware of that and we gave them safe space during that time. The partnership that we had developed with intercultural youth was um, transformational. I mean, it's the only way I can describe it. I mean, we really, you know, Rihanna and our relationship with intercultural youth has really supported us on this process throughout. Um, we're a staff of over 100 staff, the majority of whom are white within our context itself. And often when we started exploring this, the first reaction from some staff could be a defensive reaction. Um, in, you know, and I've been there myself, you know, I'm not racist, you know, that that first initial knee jerk reaction that, that that some of our staff were having. And we needed to move beyond that in, in the professional learning that, that we were doing. Um, and as I say, that work with intercultural youth supporting us was really powerful in that journey. And we wanted these conversations with staff through professional learning to be structured. So we wanted to provide them with the knowledge and the learning um, that would support that, but also, you know, creating that common vocabulary that all staff were using was very important in terms of, of this process. But we also wanted to um, build in reflection time within that and to give, you know, look at look at some of the, the readings and discussions we were having and why we needed to do this as a whole staff, as a faculty, but then actually having individual reflection time as well for staff to engage with some of the conversations that we're having because you know exploring the baggage that does come with white privilege is very challenging i found it challenging when i first started exploring it and and you know some of those more informal conversations that were happening by the photocopier or in the staff room were almost arguably more important than those more structured conversations that, that we were having 
and and Kirsten talked about this for many staff when we started this process there's a real element of fear and nervousness about getting it wrong and about saying the wrong thing um and really one of the crucial roles that Rihanna has played coming in for intercultural youth is supporting staff through this you know encouraging them to be open and honest with pupils and 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 with staff and to acknowledge that sometimes we can get it wrong not intentionally but being more open about that in the discussions um and you know what I've mentioned this once already but what's really been crucial for us is, is moving from white awareness to white allyship um and part of this whole process with staff um, has been to not simply ensuring that our, our BPOC community feel represented within the curriculum and, and fully integrated in part of our school community, but also challenging the way that our pupils who identify as white think and react and that kind of two responsibilities within, within the curriculum itself. So that was our main goal with regards to staff. The next step, which was profoundly important, was engagement with our BPOC families and importantly, our BPOC pupils. Um, now, as a school community, we had never created a safe space just for our BPOC pupils to talk. Um, and in many ways, to get this journey right, it was really important that we had an honest narrative of the lived experience of peoples within our school. And what was crucially important for us was that was Rihanna's role in, in chairing this um, and facilitating this and supporting our BPOC pupils, at creating a space where they could be honest and open without fear of judgment, you know, without fear of perhaps offending a member of staff within the community, if, if you know, in terms of, of their experience. And, and this data, you know, which it is data, this insight uh, that this has provided to the school community has been really powerful. Um, Rihanna has been involved in running lunchtime groups uh, for our young people, but also particularly as part of this um, uh, sort of focus of change, the strategic change we're trying to bring in, who's also facilitated a specific group within teaching time, just looking at the curriculum. So last year, um, we pulled together a group from um, right across through the school, actually to share their experience of our current curriculum, both the explicit and the implicit curriculum. Um, and, you know, this was really powerful. And in many ways, some of the most powerful data, you know, that I think that we had collated, you know, to for a school, I've been at the school for a long time and I care so much about the school. And here some of our S1 pupils said they'd withdrawn from extracurricular football because of racist comments that they were still being exposed to. It was so hard for me to hear, but so important for me to hear that that actually was the lived experience of, of our young people. They were also incredibly insightful in terms of comments they were making in terms of um, you know, they, they were talking about some of the literature that was being used in the English curriculum and, and English have been trying really hard to have um, more diverse literature. But, you know, sometimes they're just making the point that would just be really nice to have a novel where a, a person of colour is just presented as a, you know, a person that's haven't had any challenges and, and hasn't had to, to fight against something. And, you know, just some really interesting reflections for us to take away with us. Um, so. You know, what this provides us with in this journey of what we needed to do, we made, we made sure we were much clearer about exactly where we are, where we were at that moment in time and where what we needed to focus on next with regards to our, our curriculum. Um, and as I say, it's some of the most powerful data that I've I've heard. And then in addition, as long as as well as working with BPOC um, learners, we really wanted to engage with their families. So actually just have targeted um, safe spaces for our families who identify as BPOC in a similar situation just to share their experiences, what they're hearing from their children. Some of them, uh, quite interestingly, had been um, pupils themselves that experienced the school and then their children had come through the school. And again, it was just creating that safe, protected space for, so we really listened, and that's what this, it was listening, it wasn't even, you know, us going in with our own agenda, it was literally just hearing what their lived experience were, currently was, and what we could do next to, to move things forward. We also have um, 
quite we have very close connections with our local mosque as well um and we were trying to do some you know and we're continuing to do some great um community work with our the, the mosque that we have um as well um they've been helping out recently with the with the food bank um so in that first journey focusing on professional learning and protected time for staff then really collecting that lived experience of where we currently are in our local context and and what our next step should be and that was moving into this co-construction and i really wanted to be a co-construction that was coming from from everyone of the vision for um our curriculum and what we wanted our curriculum to feel like and to be lived in for our, our young people um, in the school itself um, so what we then moved on to was actually trying to pull together everyone's views for a vision statement. Um, so we did, um, we connected with um, our BPOC families, we connected with all staff, we connected with our, our children, um, and then we opened it up to our wider school community as well, because we wanted this very much to come from the whole school community, just to share with us um, almost their, their vision for what they wanted their curriculum. Uh, to what they wanted our curriculum to be as we move forward and that was that was where we reached at the end of, of year one moving into year two what we are now focusing in on is how we are going to do this so we ho hopefully have established that that focus on why this should be a priority and now it's looking at how we're going to do this and the strands for this in terms of what we are, are doing at the moment is we have a voluntary staff working group um, so again, we're trying to spread leadership right across the school and sort of unleash that social capital across the school. Um, who and they are working together to pull together a toolkit of resources um, that can support curriculum change and curriculum development across all subject areas. So we've got that implemented, and that's the, the first step that we're doing. Then we've, we're using a planning tool that's actually come from the City of Edinburgh, um, whereby faculties can work with this document and can strategically focus in on the areas of the curriculum that they're going to change the knowledge that they're, they're going to bring in the new texts that they're going to have the discussions that we're going to, to add into that and within the um, staff working group that we have there is each faculty is represented so that staff lead is taking the responsibility for actually overseeing that planning curriculum document for each of those curricular areas, which means we will then be able to, to pull that all together. Our pupil curriculum focus group is ongoing. So as each curricular area is completing their overview of their curriculum, they are going to be taking it back to the pupil group so they can give them feedback in terms of um, what their views are about that curriculum, in terms of the, the progress that, that is being made within that. Um, and in what we're also doing is we're continuing with the engagement with, with families as well. Um, I'm setting a sort of target at the end of each um, term in terms of just making sure there's that sort of strategic architecture to support the journey that we're on um, in terms of um, where we're going with this. So year one was very much focusing on why, year two we're moving to how we are going to do this. Just a quick note on our, in, our work with Intercultural Youth Scotland, I mean really to have someone outside of the school community to come in um, and work with us and reflect and challenge and support us, but in a very um, uh, gentle manner, um, but still quite challenging manner has been very powerful for us. Um, and you know the space and support and structure that she's given and supported us really has been um, transformative for us. In terms of key um, reflections and how learning has, has helped me, the learning that I did last year in uh, internship two has supported me and challenged me in leading this role. I mean, in many ways, I think that um, a lot of the discussion about this curriculum really has the power to get the heart of the debate around that purpose of education um, and what we are measuring within education um, and it goes to a lot of, uh, links to a lot of Biesta's work that we were looking at last year in the interheadship program in that you know are, with education are we simply talking about those bureaucratic measures like attainment or has education got a more powerful way into contributing towards that creation of a democratic society in which racism and discrimination um, is is challenged by all members of society and there's 
you know, for me, there is a balance between the two, but it's very important that as educators, I think, and as leaders, we are trying to support both of those. Some of the key messages from a leadership point of view that I've really learned as part of this process is firstly that importance of this sort of strategic architecture around your vision. You know, it's one thing to, to have a vision, but looking at actually the structures and supports that you're, you're putting in place to make sure that vision actually um, you are achieving that vision and you're making progress on that vision um, as you move forward. And the way that I very much have done that is almost through sort of agile leadership and trying to break down on a, a term by term basis, um, key focuses for that. Um, what also was very powerful for me as part of this journey is the role that emotional leadership plays within education in that this journey with staff and, and supporting staff through this journey and challenging staff through this journey has been very challenging um, for staff. And I think it's OK to acknowledge that and to talk about that. And I think sometimes talking about emotions can almost be seen as a sign of weakness within leadership and within education. And I think that I've really learned a huge amount about the importance of emotional leadership and the role that that plays and the role that we can play in supporting um, and and just talking about that more in, a, in our process. Just as Kirsten said, it was really important for me that this vision was achieved not to people, uh, but through and with our school community. If it wasn't going to be some tokenistic change, it was really important that somehow um, I'm, I, I worked with others to try and make this process as um, horizontal as possible and really thought about how leadership could be unleashed right across the school um, and creating those transparent roles both you know through distributed and distributive lead the distributive leadership right across the school itself um, and yeah I think that they are some of the key um, my key takeaways uh, from this and also as Kirsten said that this is very much a marathon and not a sprint. You know, this, if we're going to get this right um, as a school community, I want to lead this journey um, delicately. You know, one, I want to challenge, but I want to be considerate and I want to make sure that we are doing everything correctly as we move along and giving everyone time and space to do these things properly so it's, it's fully embedded. Um, so we are still very much in the middle of this journey, um, but we are still, you know, we're, we're fully committed uh, to it. And it's also led to some really interesting discussions actually about the role of a curriculum within a school as well, which, is, which has unleashed lots of other, other debates with them. Um, so that's just, a brief overview. Apologies, I actually pulled up the wrong PowerPoint at the start. In terms, of, this is sorry, Kevin. I pulled up the wrong one at the start there. Um, but that gives a brief overview of kind of the journey that we're on. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. So I think one of the things that came across so strongly to me there from both of your presentations was how honest you're being. I think sometimes when you go along to you know to presentations that folk are given about their practice. It comes across as everything's fine, this is what we did and now it's all sorted. But I think both of you have reflected so honestly about the journey that you are on, that you have been on, that you will be on in the future as well. So thank you so much for both of your inputs. Now we're going to move into the next phase of our event. I've got a couple of questions. I've been scribbling away madly while you've been talking there, Kate and Kirsten, of a couple of questions to start off our discussion. I know sometimes after you've heard two discussions, you're a bit of a brain break and a bit of time to process and filter what you've heard. So as I'm asking the questions that I've got initially, please feel free to add your questions to the chat. We'll also open it up so that folk can um, come on screen and ask their questions as well. So I'm just going to kick off a couple of quick questions uh, first of all. So Kirsten, if I could start with you um, initially, you talked about so much there in terms of your presentation. What aspects of the learning do you think are unique to your own school context and what aspects do you think are more universal for other people? Okay, I mean, I'm fortunate that I've got a setting where there's nursery all the way through to senior six children all on the one campus. So that's been, you know, that's quite unique and it's, you know, it's wonderful to have it. And that's been really powerful, actually, when I talked about having the children lead the learning and actually getting them to come together. So the senior school diversity ambassadors have joined in with the junior school. And that's been amazing to have that partnership 
um, and getting them to support one another and particularly for the primary children to see these, um, you know, mature students who are fantastic and are, you know, they're directing me too. And they've been, you know, for me as a primary educator to have um, children with lived experience coming down. So somebody asked how many staff do you have? We don't have a big staff number, but we do have children. They're coming down and saying, we would like this. When we were in primary school, we would have liked that. When we ask the primary children, they're always very positive, enthusiastic, telling us everything is great. Mm. We talk to the senior school and they're a bit more like, yeah, no, you could change this. And why have you not got this? So it's, it's fantastic. So they've been really helpful. So for me, that unique being able to tap into and talk with senior school colleagues and look at their programme as well and really work in partnership with them and see this as a whole school has been really powerful and really helpful, beneficial for me. I suppose, I mean, Universal, you're hearing Kate and I, talking about a lot of the same thing, same things that we're grappling with, the same challenges and, you know, trying to work things around. This is still very new to us as well and trying to find materials, but also being critically aware of what's out there too and, and being careful about what we select. Um, and just that, um, you know, we're all looking at the curriculum as well and our approaches. So that's, that is universal across and the, the challenges that, that we all all face I think you'll see when you go into this so it's supporting one another it's been really helpful being part of networks. Mm -hmm. Great thank you very much Kate what about you what's unique to Royal High in this work and what is more universal? Um, what's unique to Royal High I mean I think in terms of the context of our school having that central visionary statement of we all belong here was a really powerful starting point. And that's been part of our vision and values for, for, for quite some time. But I think that was such a powerful mechanism to start this process because actually through, you know, the lived experience that we were gathering from our uh, young people and their families, not everyone felt that they did belong here. So I think that was that was very powerful, you know, starting point that was, was unique to us. You know, we have, you know, it's proxy as about, 14% of our school population who identify as BPOC, um, which is relatively low, you know, compared to maybe some other schools, if you're going into, well, certainly where I grew up in Liverpool, or if you go, you know, in, into uh, cities in Glasgow. So, um, but I don't think that changed the nature, but I think it's made us very aware that actually a key role of what we are doing is educating white people about white privilege you know in terms of the, the context that we are in as well as making sure that we can hold our hands up and say that you know we are we are showing representations of all of our young people through our curriculum and through our discussions and, and through what what we're you know what we're communicating as important you know in terms of the curriculum itself um i mean in terms of universal um aspects i mean we've I've, I touched upon it at the end of my presentation there. I mean, we've had some quite interesting discussions about how much agency staff feel they have over the curriculum that they are delivering, which I would imagine is a universal conversation, particularly when we get up into the senior phase. Um, and that's led to some, some interesting discussions, um, you know, particularly in our science faculty, for example, and actually it's, it's how we can then challenge, yes, you can't change the, the knowledge that you're being expected to deliver, but you can challenge, challenge why that knowledge is valued and where that has come from. So I think that whole discussion about control and agency over an individual teacher to deliver that curriculum, I would, which are some of the discussions that we would have, I would imagine that they are quite universal discussions. And, and actually what, what I, almost anticipated more and I, that didn't happen in our context and I think just because of I guess the debate that sometimes happens around schools addressing issues with poverty you know I wasn't sure if maybe some staff might say this is too big an issue for teachers to be dealing with this is you know we're looking at a society issue and society should be, be challenging this I mean thankfully that that didn't come across from any staff within our school I think every staff felt that you know and actually if you look at your GTCS standards it's part of your professional responsibility but I don't know the extent to which maybe that is coming across in in some areas with, within Scotland but I think you know it's led to some really interesting discussions about the role of the curriculum um, which I'd imagine is happening across all of Scotland. Absolutely, thank you very much. Another uh, theme that came across really strongly in both of your presentations 
was about the power of professional learning and the impact that professional learning can have and how important it is. So I'm really wondering in terms of the leadership aspect of it, what did you learn about professional learning and the importance and the power of professional learning? But what did you learn about yourself as a leader of professional learning in your school? Kate, we come to you first and we'll go to Kirsten. Um, so, I mean, this is a hard one to, to answer in some ways because, you know, I think that professional learning is, um, it's so critical, you know, in, in terms of being a learner as an educator, I think is is just a fundamental part of, of, of being a teacher in terms of putting yourself in, in that process. I mean, in terms of particularly thinking about leadership within this and, and you know, sort of professional learning on leadership, I think, um, first of all, I think a crucial thing about professional learning as a leader is exploring your own moral compass through professional learning. So actually really finding your authentic self and knowing yourself and knowing your practice um, and I think professional learning has really helped me to explore that. Um, I think one of the challenges of, of being a leader in Scotland is there are so many pressures on you from so many different directions that are often coming from above on a school and I think what professional learning has made me realise particularly over you know the, the, the last um, year and a half is um, that critical re reflection on that kind of multi-directional force for change, but also developing that courage um, to stand up for your own local context and what suits your own local context. And I think that has been a very powerful journey, thinking about those leadership qualities that can lead that strategic change that, that suits your own context within the, the wider dimensions that, that you're operating within as well. Um, and in addition, I think what I find very powerful and hopefully it came across in my presentation is um, the role of data. And I know that I think that Zoe's in here in terms of the, the presentation that she was doing about data. But, you know, to me, some of the most powerful data that we collected to justify why this strategic change was so important for our local context was that lived experience of our young people. So not a bureaucratic measurement of data, but actually really properly listening to what was going on in our, our community and finding the time to do that. So um, I think they're some of the key, um, yeah, the, the, the key impact and messages that I've taken away from, from professional learning recently. Great, thank you. Alison, did you want to come in at this point? Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I was just reflecting there and listening to Kate. First of all, thanks to both Kirsten and Kate. With National Responsibility for the Interheadship Programme, it's just absolutely fantastic to hear the impact of your learning on that programme on your learners and their communities as well as yourself. So thank you both for your presentations. But I was just reflecting a great question, Kevin, because I'm sitting here thinking nationally we're often asked, how can we put more of this into the Interhedge programme? So particularly the area of anti-racism and within the context of leadership comes up often because of national priorities and because it's, you know, it's it's a must. And, and I don't need to tell the, the colleagues here today of that. But we are also asked often to add additional content in. And those of you involved in Interhedge will know exactly as Kate has demonstrated, it's about knowing yourself as a leader within your context and what your context needs. So I'm just interested on, on both Kate and Kirsten's reflections on if we were to enhance the programme in some way without cutting across the importance part that is you in your context. If you have any reflections, maybe not for just now, I'll give you thinking time, but it would be interesting to get your perspectives on because for you, this was a need within your community, but if for others in the programme, they've looked at different aspects because you said it, Kate, you know, there are multiple demands on school leaders. So knowing your school, knowing yourself is very much a part of, of interheadship. And yet we do have the tensions of all of those important policy directions um, in there. So I'm not sure if I have a question or whether I'm just saying, do please come and talk to me some more later. <laughs> Or if you had anything to add to that. And I see someone's put in the chat pane about the Building Racial Literacy Programme, yes, which is um, 
led by one of my colleagues and it's absolutely fantastic and there is something around the place of interheadship and then the place of 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 more specific professional learning as well so yeah i don't think i've got a question in there but just a reflection perhaps thanks Alison. i think that's a, a really important reflection and i think possibly in what you've got to say next, Kirsten, that I might pick up some of what Alison is is heading towards there in her comments. So, Kirsten, do you want to share with us your kind of experience of how you've thought about professional learning and yourself as a leader of professional learning? And I guess the, the question that I've got in my head, um, similar to Alison, is what is distinct about this type of professional learning? What is different about the type of professional learning that you've got to offer in this context of working around anti-racism and in anti-racist education? So a simple question for you to answer, yeah, Kirsten. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is, as Kate said and Alison, it is really about starting and it's back to that triangle, knowing myself, you know, really starting there. You know, you can't just pick up a book or follow a guide. You've really got to know yourself and where you're coming from and question yourself. Um, and, you know, actually looking, as I said, looking at what the different types of racism is like understanding um you know like there's internalized racism I hadn't realized that before so it's it's understanding all those things and realizing you're still learning um and asking questions and you know you'll get it as someone said in the chat but you get it wrong apologize and move on and hopefully learn from one another so is is that as well the answers aren't all out there as well and when staff come to you with profession, I don't have all the answers. We're on this journey together. So, you know, it's it's that more openness as well uh, to that. And it's like, you know, it's not a straight path. I, I think also part of the course, which was really helpful. Well, we also did those Education Scotland uh, modules as part of Into Headship. And there was a section on racism in there. And that was really helpful. I actually was disappointed with myself because I did it at the end of the course. And I thought, if I did this at the beginning, that would have been so helpful for all my reading. So tips for people who are doing the course at the moment, get on and find those modules because they're really helpful and they direct you to loads of reading. So there you go. Um, they were really helpful. And, I, you know, it's articles. And actually, I've taken a lot of those articles I did, readings from Professor um, Rowena Arshad, and brought to staff discussion groups. So we've sat and read, not you know, just chapters from books, chapters about white privilege, we've read and discussed them together and discussed, you know, some people are saying, well, some um, children don't see colour, you know, and discussing these things um, and like, going back to evidence and research. Certainly for me, um, part of the interheadship encouraged us to really take time to look critically at texts and publications and um, really think about things with a critical eye. And, you know, someone came to me with a resource because they weren't happy with how we were doing things. And they said, this is how, how you should be doing it. And then actually, when we looked at it, it was quite damaging. You know, it could have caused more harm than good. And you have to sometimes look at things and think, who's this been written by? What's it for? And whose voice is missing from it? So it's, it's, it's looking at things with criticality, but it's having all that professional understanding behind you that gives you the, the confidence to say, wait a minute, I don't think that's the right line and true to my values and belief you keep coming back to that your values i think a key thing and it's not just this course but actually covid has taught me is to slow down um and you know and kate was talking about the process they've been in and i think to get it right you have to take it really steady and it, you know the into headship course talks that as well as like actually building time for reflection I was very much a doer and problem solve and let's get on with things so it's actually stop where are we? Are we rushing ahead? Are we getting everybody in involved? You know, I've got, I work with brilliant people and they, I'm always telling them to slow down as well. We work together. It's like, hold on, let's get everybody involved. Let's reflect. Are we going, you know, do we need to change our direction? Question things as well. So it's making sure that we've got that wide engagement and deep understanding. So is that pausing, reviewing, refining? And, you know, it's still still researching, keeping it wide, keeping it fresh because we're, we're still learning in this process. So I think that's it because you don't have the answers. It's not there. It's not a program that you just pick up. You're, you're, and every context is slightly different as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So the next question kind of narrows in a wee bit on that because you've gone through this incredible journey. You've learned so much. You've talked so eloquently about the journey that you've been on. 
So in terms of where you go next with it, what do you need as a leader in terms of your own professional learning that's going to help you progress this work, but also deepen your own understanding? Kate, can I come to you on that one first? I think one of the key things that I really learned from last year and I want to take forward is how I work and how I support the school to work with families um, as part of this process. Because I think sometimes, and again, into headship really made me reflect on this in that so often relationships with families can be vertical in the sense that often it's schools telling families what we think they need to know about learning or about their their children and actually when we uh, created those safe spaces for our families who identify as BPOC to come in and we just listened and didn't go in with an agenda or anything like that it was so powerful just like with the pupils to hear their their experiences and and I think you know we want this we want our vision um, for this anti-racist curriculum to be embedded right across our school community and reaching out into families. So I think what I'm really keen to do to move forward is actually really continue to strengthen those relationships with families and really listen to them more and actually hear from them what they um, what they need from us and what we aren't doing. And, and I'm very aware that last year, in a totally justifiable way, I very much ring-fenced our parents and families who identified as BPOC because I wanted to make sure that their voice was heard. You know, talking about voices that aren't often heard, I felt that their voice had not been heard um, clearly. Um, but also as part of this process, and I know, Kirsten, these were some of the challenges that you faced last year, we have to make sure that our full school community, so all of our families are clearly aware of what we are doing as a school community and what our priority is and the, and working with families to be supporting on, on this as well. So for me, moving forward, um, it's continuing to try and really unleash leadership across the school. So actually every staff member is taking responsibility for leading on this. So in their classrooms, in terms of come back to the curriculum, how they're living and breathing and enacting that curriculum for our young people, um, how we've got those clear, transparent leadership roles right across the staff through our voluntary staff working group, through our designated staff leadership roles that, that staff can go. So we're continuing to sort of unleash and maintain and sustain that uh, momentum amongst staff, and particularly when you've got new staff coming in. But I think what I've been really focusing on this year and I'm keen to take forward is just how we are engaging with the full school community to support on this on this journey as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Kirsten, what about you? What do you think you need just now as a leader in terms of your own professional learning? How can you extend your thinking and, and take it to the next stage? Well, as I've mentioned, I've got two colleagues who are doing the Building Racial Literacy Programme at the moment, and that's brilliant because they come back and discuss what they've been doing in their session, bring back the materials, we review it together as a team. So that's keeping things quite fresh. I think um, also having contacts, you know, like Kate and other people um, who are doing the same. So a, a network, for me, a network of people doing this, I think to have a safe space where you can share ideas. I mean, there's, there's great things going on and people are sharing in the chat bar different uh, links to things to help one another. And I think that's what we need. We need um, a place where we can find resources, bounce ideas off, talk about experiences and support one another, I think is what uh, it helps you as well. Um, and just keep I uh, keep attending professional learning um, events like this so that you're hearing from people. Um, you know, I'm, go I'm going to go and happily sit and listen to other ones in the future. Um, and, uh, and also returning to some of those documents as well, the ones from Education Scotland, you know, and um, CRER, just go back to them and see where are we? Are, are we do we need to keep going back? Have we missed anything? Um, don't just think. Oh, I think you've got a mute there, Kirsten. Sorry, <laughs> I just moved my elbow and off we go. I just think, um, yeah, it's just keeping that research going and going back to those documents that we used at the beginning. Um, and not thinking that we've we've ticked it off because we haven't. Um, we're all it, and it's just leading that learning community and it, also making sure that I think as a uh, profession that we 
it's a bit like when you do child protection training, you have to keep going back to it. You have to, we, this is going to have to be revisited. Keep going. We can't just think you've done it. You can't, they won't. So you have to keep going with it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And the last question I've got to ask before I open it out to the, the virtual room to invite you to ask your questions. We were chatting the other day, uh, Kirsten and Kate and I, and something you said, Kirsten, really struck me. You were talking about your holidays and you were talking about um, where you've been on your holiday and, and how even when you're on holiday and you're meant to be relaxing and you're meant to be switched off, you were thinking so differently about what you were seeing on your, your trip. So I wonder for both of you, how has this experience of leading um, this important aspect of our work, how has it changed you? How has it changed you as a, a leader? How has it changed you as a teacher? How has it changed you as a person? So since I referenced your holiday, Kirsten, we'll come to you first. <laughs> yeah, tell everyone where I was on my holiday. <laughs> yeah, it was actually, I was on a historical tour um, in, in Berlin and it was just really fascinating. I mean, obviously there, with um, what was going on in the history of the city. But it was interesting to listen to the speaker. And I ended up chatting to her about anti-racist education and just talking about how, what the buildings represent and what you were, what, you know, you're conditioned to see and what are we not seeing? And it was just that, having that level of discussion with her and actually not looking at just at the guidebooks. I'm like, well, the guidebooks are not telling me all of this. So it was it was fascinating. Like I have changed, and I'm, you know, my family are like, oh, here she goes again. You know, I'm just yeah, asking these questions, looking at things more critically, and being aware of um, my view and as, where does that coming from? Where have I caught that these ideas from? So it is um, yeah, understanding my identity, but also what's being portrayed to me, and not just in what you read, but what you see, pictures. Built, how buildings, what buildings are there and why are there, who decided that so it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely affected my relationships, my actions um, definitely, definitely so the, that outlook has changed and I think also the whole process um, I met, you know, with quite a lot of challenges so I've, I've learned to be more confident in myself um, learned that I can be calm under pressure under pressure I've learned to listen and not to be defensive. You know, you listen to people, um, but stay true to your own values and, and, and make sure that that comes through and believe in yourself as well. Thanks so much for that. I think it's a really powerful um, message. Kate, what about you? How have you been changed by this experience? Um, I think for me, the most powerful thing I've found about the whole experience is it's made me really connect with my why again I think in terms of the role of education within social justice and actually what is important about what we are doing within schools um, again I mentioned this earlier I think there's often so much pressure on schools to measure those things that are easy to measure so to measure attainment and to measure those bureaucratic measures but actually you know leading this project um has just made me think and made me position myself in terms of what actually is the purpose of education and yes of course it is about attainment and yes of course it is about securing the best outcomes but this process has reminded me the crucial role that we have and the responsibility that we have to try and um educate our next generation of young people to challenge racism and to really be proactive as opposed to reactive in challenging that racism that that exists within society and I think that's what I've really taken away from that in that it's really helped me reconnect with my why and made me call you know linking back to what I was saying about emotional leadership as well really being quite explicit about that and talking about that quite openly um, within um, education. So, and I've, you know, I've learned so much. There've been unconscious bias that I've come from. I mean, just to be, you know, really honest and open. I remember when we were first talking about with Intercultural Youth Scotland having ring-fenced um, groups for our young people who identify as, as BPOP, as I say, the terminology that our students want to use. And I remember there was a little bit in this, oh, but will that be, is that not just creating more divisions and, and, and now when I look back, I'm, I, you know, I'm quite ashamed for having those views because I've seen the power of having that 
protected space for voices that aren't heard very often. So the whole process has really made me challenge and come to terms with some, um, yeah, some unconscious bias that I maybe had as well. But I think most important, I think leading this, which has been such a privilege for me, is, has helped me reconnect with my belief in what education is all about. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. So I'd like to now open it up if you have any questions um, you'd like to ask either Kate or Kirsten. And if you want, I know there's a few questions that I can pick up in the chat already, but if you'd like to ask your question on screen, that we're always very happy to see people and to hear from them live in person. So if you want to pop your hands up, that'd be great. And we can also use some of the questions in the chat. So I can see the first hand up is Stuart. Hi, Stuart, and you come. Hi, folks. Uh, that was great, Kate and Kirsten. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thank you. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I agree with, uh, you know, we have to drive to educate the whole student. Uh, relationships are key, and I'm always thinking about tolerance and equality and universalism when I'm in life, really. Uh, often I think of, uh, everyone's got a few quotes that they keep in their head. Uh, obviously, uh, Martin Luther King, when he says, uh, Judge not by the colour of their skin, by the content of their character. That's one that often rings with me in terms of universalism. And one thing I'd like them, uh, Kate and Kirsten to think about is what, how does that, what impact could that have in terms of maintaining a, a sort of difference? You talked about it a little bit there, maybe towards the end there, Kate, uh, uh, embedding a difference when we're trying to maintain a dream of here. And that kind of reverses round to the other side that uh, by having these, uh, embedding the difference in diversity, uh, how does that affect the individual when we see, when we're thinking about the individual rather than perhaps the group or community that, that they belong to? There's an expectation, perhaps a, a forced expectation on the individual to follow us, a, a script or a way. We've had some bad experiences where individuals have been seen as being only superficially attached to their to a group. Uh, so that was a couple of things that I was thinking about the, the embedding the dream and maintaining the space for the individual. And I'd just like to follow just one quick little point. Yeah, in a past life historian, uh, I was there. Uh, I, I find that we have to remember there is quite a difference in culture between the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think we have to be very wary of taking issues from America and then just bringing them across as a whole. So I'd, I'd be quite interested in anyone's comments about the importance of that difference. OK, thanks, Stuart. Kate, any thoughts around that? There was a lot. There was a lot in there, Stuart. Let me have a <laughs> Do you know what? I think the, if I could pick on the point that you were making about the importance of the individual within that and you know there was, there was a, a comment in the chat about this in terms of you know using any sort of label like BPOC there are inherent flaws within that there are because you know you are assigning a label in some ways to, to a group of people and, and we have been we're working very close with intercultural youth in terms of the language that, that we are using for that um, we have the impact that we have seen on the individual based upon the group spaces that we are creating has been quite profound in that having given so so thinking about that identity of, of a BPOC student which is you know in many ways they have been almost given a label in that but giving them that safe space to share their lived experience in school in the corridors in you know extracurricular activities has been so powerful for them as an individual that actually you can see how much more confident um, they are in terms of voicing their opinion in terms of leading events across the school you know there are real issues of um, intersectionality within that as well because that you know often you are crossing lines associated with gender and sexuality which very much comes into that and that was actually one of the the key challenges that I faced last year in terms of making sure that our our work with other equalities group, we still maintain that, but also looking at the overlapping nature within that as well, and indeed neurodiversity too within that. Someone's just just pop that in. So, you know, I think there is the danger. There is always the danger with using any sort of label um, in terms of people feeling they have to to conform to that. And what we are trying really hard within that is to 
acknowledge difference in all its different ways, but to actually challenge the stereotypes that, that go with that. That's kind of what we're, we're trying to do um, through this, this whole process. Um, so I don't know if that kind of answers that, yeah. that part of what what you were sort of touching upon in terms of you know we really are trying to make sure we are still celebrating the individual and actually the identity of the individual can be so complex it can cross over so many different you know areas and you know we've got some of our in fact our link police officer um identifies as asian and she's a female and she's doing some some fantastic work with some of our um young women who are asian within school so there's lots of complexities within there but we're really trying hard not to apply a generic label you know it, it's about moving beyond that it's about acknowledging difference but also acknowledging the fact that there is still racism within this country and I hear what you're saying about America but within this country there is still structural racism that we really want to try and challenge um, and address so I'm not Absolutely. sure if that answered your question but just some reflections <laughs> that was great thank you very much indeed Kirsten, I wonder if I could pick up some questions in the chat that I see here um, for you from your presentation. So Hardeep was asking about looking at lived experiences of staff and wanting to know a wee bit about how many uh, BAME staff you, you had currently at that time and did the BAME parents engage with your consultation evenings. And Lindsay is asking about how you might have approached Black History Month at school. Okay. Yeah, and we've got We've got a small number of um, people from minority backgrounds in our staff. Um, we would love, you know, we want to, but I know that's an issue with Scottish education. We're trying to, there's a big push on that um, to, for recruitment for more teachers. Um, but, I, and I didn't want, we didn't want it to be that it should be, if you're from, you know, black and minority ethnic group, you have to lead this or be part, you know, it's, it's it, everybody has a responsibility to take this forward. Um, but people did share personal experiences if they wanted to, which was really helpful. Our parents did engage. Um, it was open to everyone. Um, and we had actually a really high number from the um, black and minority ethnic group attend and contribute and help and you know take things forward with us so that was really helpful um certainly the evening it helped because we went into smaller groups so i think that meant people could and then could break out and then come and see me afterward you know so that we tried to make it as gentle and you know easy as possible so that people you know felt comfortable and could uh, contact us in any way so it wasn't just come to the evening but also you can speak to us at any other time as well and come and discuss if people come in and review what we're doing as well and help us and, and, and guide us in that so that's been really helpful and actually parents really wanted to be involved we're we're really happy with what we were doing and happy I think you know they came in and said is this a real consultation yes it is <laughs> you know we're not telling you it is a consultation all right okay so you know it was being absolutely said yep yeah, we want we want to know um, what we should you know help us here work in partnership with us uh, for Black History Month it was uh, the children that led that actually and um, we've done it a couple of times and it's changed but they the children lead it they research they've led uh, assemblies and activities for classes to do so that was our pupil diversity groups that were very much leading that um, which was Fantastic. And they're, they're leading it on, they we're looking at the history of racism and that linked in with our very much the theme of be an upstander, not a bystander, you know, be an ally, um, help each other and um, be aware of what's going on. And also looking at positive role models as well. So turn it positively rather than always, you know, bad, you know, things that have happened but into positive experiences as well, positive role models. So, so that was very much the children's take on what they wanted to do for that. Fantastic, thank you very much. I think we've got time for just one last question, if we do it really, really quickly. So I noticed Johnny Main, you've got a question there in the chat about engaging with um, Black and minority ethnic uh, learners and with families as well. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I can come in here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah I can hear you fine. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, it was really just to look at, we're we're working with Intercultural Youth Scotland as well, um, have a great working relationship with them. I, th I suppose it's just trying to navigate sensitively around involving the BPOC community. And 
I suppose there's that that keenness to try and gather and consult with the BPOC community without unintentionally othering the BPOC community and looking to target and select groups of young people from that community. It's more about a holistic overview of getting everyone's views. Um, it's just to get, I suppose, from, from both speakers this evening, just to ask how you went around almost creating safe spaces or promoting safe spaces to, to those young people and consulting with those young people specifically without unintentionally othering. Take that one. Yeah, I'll come in first because obviously we've been working with intercultural youth, uh, Johnny. We kind of use two approaches uh, with well, with talking about young people first and with our with our learners. Um, in that, um, because intercultural youth are supporting us with several different groups with young people, so we've got they're running drop in lunchtime sessions, but also then they are running um, inserts within the curriculum as well. Um, or, which are built in as part of our academies blocks, we've got a little bit of flexibility there. Um, so in terms of the first step, it was very much just an invite. So we opened out um, to all of our young people who identified as BPOC and we asked them to come along. And then we did a little bit of um, monitoring of that. And you know, so we had a look at who were interested and then between us, so depending on relationships, um, some staff, would approach them we would ask Rihanna to approach some of them just so we felt that we were getting a balance um, across the year group and the same with the specific curricula group because for me it was really important from a curriculum point of view that we had the full breadth of the curriculum represented through the young people there so from S1 up to S6 so it was a little bit of asking openly first of all and then doing a little bit of of, of targeted um, intervention and for our young people as well we've had kind of leadership roles emerging from that as well um, through school as well so a little bit of both with regards family engagement um, the way that I, I did that is I literally just used Seamus and extracted all of our families who identified as BPOC and sent an email invite out to them um, so that's the way that I've, I've been doing that there wasn't an enormous turnout at my first event um, so then I worked with the families that were there to think about how we could change that for next time. So work through the mosque and, you know, how we were communicating. And actually our plan is, and this was something I, I reflected on from Interheadship last year, for our, we're, we're having a big family event to celebrate the work we've been doing intercultural youth. And actually we're going to ask all of our young people who've been involved with intercultural youth to invite their families along for our celebration of that. And that whole Hopefully that will encourage families to come along as well because they're not being invited by us, they're being invited by their child to come along and, and see what they're doing. So kind of a bit of a hybrid approach, I suppose, in, in how we're sort of trying to encourage um, uh, representation. Fantastic. Thank you very much, folks. I'm really sad to say that our time is up and we've actually gone over our time. So. It's incredible how much we could spend time talking about these issues. I'm sure we could spend another five hours talking about this and only scratch the surface. So a massive, massive thank you to Kate and to Kirsten for their honesty, for their humility, for their incredible leadership in their school communities. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing and for sharing it this evening. I've popped into the chat the form if you want to join our network so you can join the future events. We have got a future event coming up on the 27th of April at 4 p.m. It's a Thursday and it's looking at intersectionality and it's looking at how um, all these different issues are linked and we're going to be looking at um, the work of Dr. Gita Marcus during that session. So you're all very welcome to come and join us for that session as well. So please do join up through the forms that have popped into the chat. Thank you so much for everything that you put in the chat tonight for all your contributions and your questions. And finally, to Kate and to Kirsten for sharing their fantastic practice. So thank you very much, everybody. Great to see you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.